Boa noite. Vamos dar início a mais um webinar organizado pela Sociedade Portuguesa de Pneumologia. Eu queria, em primeiro lugar, cumprimentar a SPP por estas iniciativas que têm, de certa forma, ajudado a comunidade científica, também os doentes e a população em geral a entender melhor problemas relacionados com esta, com esta infecção e com a doença respiratória. Por isso, felicito a Sociedade Portuguesa de Pneumologia, particularmente o seu presidente por esta iniciativa muito interessante e vamos dar início, de facto, a mais um webinar, desta vez e pela primeira vez para discutir doença intersticial. Não tem sido um tópico muito abordado, a fibrose pulmonar, e hoje será, na realidade, o tópico que vamos desenvolver durante cerca de uma hora ou um pouco menos. E eu estou muito satisfeito por poder fazê-lo em muito boa companhia. Tenho comigo dois convidados excelentes, de excelência e com origem em duas regiões que têm sido, de facto, bastante afetadas por esta epidemia, por esta pandemia, concretamente, e já mais à frente os, os irei apresentar, o, o professor Venerino Poletti, da, de Forli, da Emília Romana, e a doutora Cláudia Valenzuela, de, de Madrid, eu mais à frente vou apresentá-los. I will introduce you later on, after my brief introduction, uh, Venderino and Claudia, but I will thank you, I, I will, uh, we, uh, me and the, the Portuguese society, we thank you a lot for participating in this uh, webinar organized by SPP. I think it's important that we can spread information, the more information we can, not only to our colleagues, to, but also to the patients and to, to the community. Uh, and uh, uh, thanks for uh, in the middle of your, all your tasks and also for the problems that you are facing uh, in Emilia Romana in Madrid, uh, being uh, able to, to enter with this, uh, in this webinar. I will start a brief introduction with uh, a couple of slides that uh, will be based on the pulmonary fibrosis in the context of uh, the, the infection. This is uh, the dashboard from today where we can see that we have, uh, we are almost achieving uh, 2 million uh, infected people all around the world. And we can see for the three main countries that are affected besides US, Spain and Italy are the most affected countries uh, by the moment. This is a very interesting uh, movement where we can see The, the patients with the COVID-19 starting to raise their position regarding the top causes of death in US. And last week, COVID-19 is the first cause of death in US. So uh, exceeding heart disease, exceeding cancer, exceeding chronic lung disease and, and all the others. This is really something. And it is also Uh, something uh, that uh, we can, uh, that I, I would like to share with you. Last uh, last September, this uh, picture could have shown the industry exhibition in our last Congress of the IRS in Madrid. Unfortunately, today, this is the, the scenario that is there uh, with an, an hospital for patients with this infection. And the IRS is also very active, as we are, we all know, in this uh, scenario of the infection with the new coronavirus. And uh, this is the an editorial uh, on one of the recent issues of the European Respiratory Journal, where we can see that regarding strategies for uh, the coronavirus disease, there are much more questions and answers regarding epidemiology, regarding clinics, pathogenics and treatment. Specifically on pulmonary fibrosis, we have to look mainly if, uh, we, uh, as uh, regarding our patients with uh, idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, but also looking at other entities that might have uh, a profile of uh, progressive fibrotic disease as uh, hypersensitivity, pneumonitis, some connective tissue diseases and many others. And what we uh, may ask is, are these patients 
at higher risk of developing uh, this infection and what can happen with these patients and what kind of strategies and in prevention uh, can we add to these patients regarding this problem. The British Thoracic Society uh, delivered some recommendations recently designed to help, to help us, to help clinicians looking at ILD patients during this uh, pandemic. And uh, we can see that regarding IPF, already taking the, the drugs, pyrfenidone and nitidanib antifibrotic drugs, that this is not considered uh, a, a group of patients at, uh, with higher risk because of having this uh, antifibrotic drugs. So uh, we, uh, there is no need to, alter, to, to change drugs during this outbreak. This is the first point. Secondly, of course, these patients are at higher risk of developing the disease because of their age or because of comorbidities that are very frequent in these patients. And of course, it is important, and this is what we are doing here in Coimbra, uh, that we can manage our patients with IPF and other patients with, with uh, pulmonary fibrosis by phone and avoiding them to, to go to the hospital in this uh, situation. Uh, another point on the point number three in these uh, recommendations is that any patient that uh, is under antifibrotic, one of the antifibrotic drugs and, are, and is diagnosed with the COVID-19 and admitted to an hospital, it is not considered harmful to stop the drug for a short period of time. It can happen, for instance, if some patient is uh, being uh, managed in, a, uh, in, in an hospital and uh, maybe he is hospitalized in another hospital, it can be difficult to continue with treatment, but there is no problem with stopping the, with, uh, with the, the treatment for short periods of time. If we look at, uh, at, at, at this infection as a a possible cause of acute exacerbation in IPF. There are a lot of causes of acute exacerbation in IPF. We know that viral infection is one of the possible causes of uh, acute exacerbation. Maybe we have to, to, to deal with these patients as we, if we are dealing with a situation of acute respiratory deterioration regarding, uh, related with an acute exacerbation. And with that, Maybe we, can, we have to face uh, this that uh, we all are aware of, that there is no effective therapy by now uh, for acute exacerbation of IPF, uh, besides all, all the, uh, regarding all the, 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 the medications that we are using for these patients. And this is, in this uh, very nice paper, we can, we can uh, see that uh, there are a lot of options and possible measures for acute exacerbations in patients with idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. None with a high uh, level of recommendation. We can see that steroids, for instance, are uh, recommended as potential benefits uh, for the acute exacerbation as, for instance, non-invasive ventila ventilation, but none is uh, as a, a, a strong level of recommendation. And this is something that we might discuss and maybe we have to discuss in this scenario of the coronavirus infection, what is the benefit of non-invasive ventilation and eventually less studied high flow oxygen uh, with these patients avoiding uh, mechanical ventilation for our patients with uh, pulmonary fibrosis. And my last slide is uh, recovering a very interesting paper where uh, in an analysis of a national administrative database of, in Japan, it was shown that for patients with IPF in mechanical ventilation, there was an efficacy of uh, using a concurrent treatment, not only with steroids, but also with a combination of uh, antibiotics like macrolides and cotrimoxazole. This is something that, for instance, in our ICUs, 
it has been done or it's been done in patients with infection of with coronavirus steroids of course uh, uh, along with uh, some uh, antibiotics and macrolides are one of the, those antibiotics so those are only clues for the discussion that uh, we will start and we will start the discussion with um, the presentation of Professor Venerino Poletti. He is uh, head of the pulmonology department in Forli, uh, Morgani Hospital in Forli, in Emilia Romana. It is not the, the worst region in Italy regarding this pandemic, but it is one of the most affected. He's also professor of, of pneumology uh, and is also at this moment, he's uh, the head of um, the assembly 12 in the ERS, the assembly uh, regarding interstitial lung diseases. And also another important point is, is that Venerino, um, besides being a pulmonologist, he is also a pathologist. So I think for his presentation, it will be important, this background. And afterwards, we will listen to uh, Dr. Claudio Valenzuela, another good friend from the hospital pulmonologist in the hospital uh, La Princesa in Madrid. This is one of the uh, worst scenarios in the, in, also in, in Europe, Madrid, regarding this infection. And I think your hospital is totally dedicated to the COVID uh, infection patients at this moment. Claudia Valenzuela is also now the head of the, in CEPAR, in the Spanish uh, uh, Respiratory Society, the head of the group, working group on interstitial lung diseases. So I, I'm in a very good company. I thank you a lot for uh, your availability to be uh, together with me in this uh, webinar. And now, uh, Venerino, the stage is yours. Thank you very much, Carlos, and it's a pleasure for me to take part to this webinar to, with my Portuguese friends. And I uh, can I have the first slide, please? The, the, my presentation goes through different points. Virology means what kind of virus are we dealing with? Pathology of the disease of COVID-19 that we can have some clues for the understanding of the disease, laboratory markers and laboratory profiles that can suggest activation of a cytokine storm. And so we have an idea that there is a two-step clinical profile and also a two-step pathogenetic profile. We have radiological features that suggest that this two-step profile is right and we have some interleukin that are important then can be drug targetable. We have some animal models suggesting us that this interleukin are important. We have some data on D-dimer, D-dimer and thrombophilia. And the problem of fibrotic sequelae is appearing now because we have more time to observe patients and treatment strategy should be based at least at the beginning on pathogenetic consideration. The second slide, please. So this is a, this coronavirus is a part of a big family, uh, including a lot of viruses, mainly, uh, mainly important for uh, vet uh, medicine because they are uh, important in, uh, in pets and also they are the cause of um, cold in humans being, but there are uh, three group of viruses that are included in the beta coronavirus genera that are very important. The first two were already known and were the, and were the cause of pandemics, SARS in 2002 and three and MERS 2012. This new virus, as a, a, a big overlap with the SARS uh, coronavirus, about 90% sequence identity with SARS, but also it has a very, very strong uh, overlap with a, 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 a coronavirus already identified in bats. So the disease is considered a zoonosis. Please, the next slide. 
the replication machinery is uh, well known. Uh, uh, the, tr the translation of genome occurs in two phases. The early phase produces nRNA polymerase, and the late phase from a negative sense RNA template yields structural and non-structural problems. So the virus is a, a, a single strand positive RNA virus, the longest uh, um, RNA virus, and the structural proteins that are important are the envelope protein, the membrane protein, the nuclear capsid protein, and mainly the spike protein. Please, the next. The transmission person-to-person -person spread occurs mainly via respiratory droplets and is very similar to influenza. Uh, um, so we can acquire the virus through droplets that are in, in the air because of cough or sneeze or even because of breast activi activity but also because we touch uh, surfaces that contain these droplets. And uh, it is important to know that the transmission uh, appeared to be even higher soon after symptoms onset compared with the later in the illness and also from asymptomatic individuals. So we can acquire the disease even in a subject with, with no symptoms. And um, uh, this is important that we have data showing that they are probably the viral loads are even more present when patients are without symptoms. And the, the R node is a virus basic reproductive number. And in, for this virus, the number is around 2.5, but in Lombardy, we had some data showing that in some scenario it was more than four. The next slide. We have also some proofs documenting that there is a, a neurophical uh, modality of transmission, mainly thanks to children, because RNA material can be detected in fetus, and so we can have also this kind of transmission. And this kind of transmission can be important, for example, in a, in a um, um, situation in which elderly are in, in uh, some clinics. So it's, it's to be con it's need to be considered. The next slide. We have data showing that uh, um, akin to uh, SARS-CoV virus, the receptor to which the uh, SARS-CoV-2 uh, link to the cells, to the cells, to, to the human cells, is the uh, angiotensin converting enzyme 2. It is a transmembrane protein, and this protein is very important. And another important point is that the affinity of the uh, SARS coronavirus 2 with this. Uh, receptor is very high, higher compared to the uh, to the um, affinity observed in this previous SARS-CoV uh, viruses. Next slide. This and this protein or the enzyme is expressed in numerous human tissue, even in nasal mucosa, and the virus can reach the, for example, the brain through the olfactory nerve. And one of the symptoms at the beginning can be uh, the incapacity to, to distinguish, uh, to, to smell. So uh, the, these uh, receptors of this protein are expressed in, in, um, in the lung, in type 1 and type 2 pneumocytes, in the endothelium, in myocytes, in enteric cells, and the different expression of these receptors in human tissue vary, varies between person persons. And this could explain the clinical variability of COVID-19. So in, them, in some patients, we can have an, 
A higher expression of these receptors, receptors mainly in lungs, because so the disease can be much more important. Or we can have a higher expression in enteric cells, and diarrhea can be the, the uh, um, uh, uh, symptom at onset. Next slide. At angiotensin converting enzyme 2, which is an important protein, and its uh, expression or higher expression precipitate or loss of expression, sorry, precipitate severe acute lung failure. So it, it is a controller of the alveolar homeostasis and it can be a controller of acute lung injury, it can hinder acute lung injury after some trigger. It, it has been observed in, in animal models in wild mice and also in knockout mice. So uh, angiotensin converting enzyme 2 exhibits protective effect, for example, against lipopolysaccharide induced lung injury. So this can explain the, some uh, effect of the virus. If you have the, 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 the disappearance of this uh, receptor, we can have an increase of susceptibility to acute lung injury of or to acute uh, uh, diffuse of their damage. Next slide. Another important protein, a cellular protein that is uh, 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 necessary for the virus to enter into the cell is a protease TMPRSS2. And this protease is important because it primes these, uh, um, the virus linked to the, the the ACE2 and it, it allows the virus to enter into the cell. This, in, this uh, protease is important because we have already some drug that could inhibit it, its uh, activity and these drugs could be useful for uh, treatment of the disease. Next slide. We have also some data, some data are accumulating so that the pathogenesis can be very, very tricky or difficult to explain. We have data from some uh, data reported already in literature, and I have some data by personal um, communication from my pathologist friends, and we have some data uh, acquired from biopsy we are performing in these patients. We have diffuse alveolar damage, alveolar protein atrios, granular uh, edema as reported in alveolar spaces, uh, diffuse alveolar damage with cytopathic changes in type 2 pneumocytes, acute fibrinose organizing pneumonia, organizing pneumonia, but also microthrombi, platelet accumulation, infiltration of macrophages, and at least in, in biopsy, lymphocytes. This is what is has been observed in the lungs, but we have an enlargement of the spleen as easily documented by CT scan. We have damage in the kidney, in the heart, myocarditis, pericardial effusion, myocarditis with lymphocytic infiltration, liver steatosis and lymphocytic inflammation, lymph node enlargement, and, and thrombi and microthrombi, probably vasculitis in the um, in the vessels outside the thorax, and there is at least one case report documenting acute hemorrhagic necrotizing encephalitis. So, uh, uh, along with acute lung injury and uh, inflammation in organs that uh, are outside the thorax, micro and macro vascular damage seems to be present in different sites and can be an important pathological element. This, the next slide, please, is some, uh, some reports in the, um, in the picture uh, label A, we have acute lung injury with cytopathic effects. And in uh, the picture labeled B, we have lymphocyte infiltration in the lung. In picture labeled C, we have steatosis in the liver and some lymphocytes. And in picture D, we have uh, myocarditis with uh, lymphocytic infiltration in, uh, uh, um, in the myocardial tissue. 
Next slide. And also in these pictures, we have in uh, uh, picture A granular edema, alveolar edema, and this picture can explain, for example, the crazy paving pattern we can observe in CT scan. In pictures B, we have lymphocytic and macrophages infiltration uh, in inter interalveolar septa. In picture C, we have organizing pneumonia. And in picture D, we have macrophages infiltration. Next slide, please. Laboratory data document in, in at least uh, a significant number of cases a lymphocytopenia. We have a huge increase of LDH didymer. I ever 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 seen patient with this level of didymer, 39,000, for example. We have an increase of serum ferritin, serum interleukin 6, CPK. And in the, in the advanced stages, we have uh, uh, a reduction of platelets, thrombocytopenia, a pattern similar to that observed in hemophagocytic syndrome or macrophage, macrophage activated syndrome. Next slide. So there are emerging evidence suggesting that some patient may, may respond to virus with an exuberant cytokine storm reaction. This reaction can be already present during the innate immune reaction, but can be uh, even higher when adaptive uh, immunity appears. We have activation of uh, NLRP3 inflammasome, and we have, of course, an increase of a lot of um, protein cytokines, including, for example, interleukin-1 beta, interleukin-6, interleukin 10, interleukin 18, interleukin 13, CCL2, and so on. And probably in the advanced and chronic sta stages, an increase on pro-fibrotic uh, proteins. Next slide. So, and also we have clinical elements su suggesting us that the clinical profile can be divided in at least two steps. 14% of confirmed cases have been severe involving serious pneumonia and shortness of breath. Another 5% of patients confirmed to have the disease developed respiratory failure, septic shock and or multi-organ failure um, and potentially resulting in death. Uh, the mortality was reported around 3%, but can be higher, mainly in elderly males and fragile patients. And so we have a two-step clinical profile observed in at least a subset of patients. Next slide. So we can have the first stage called the replicative stage in which viral replication occurs over a period of about five, seven days, and an innate response occurs but this response can fail to contain the virus. Relatively mild symptoms are usually present due to, due to direct viral cytopathic effects and innate immune response. After five, seven days, an adaptive immunity stage appears because uh, we have the, the appearance of uh, the acquired immune response uh, that eventually Leak kicks into gear. This leads to falling titers of virus. However, it may also increase levels of inflammatory cytokines and lead to tissue damage, causing clinical deterioration. Next slide. And this is a scheme solving this two-step um, pathogenetic and clinical profile, viral response phase and host inflammatory response phase. And these two phases can, at least in, in, in the middle of, of the disease, overlap. Next slide. And also, CT scan analysis suggests that we can have a two-step profile because uh, uh, CT scan can be positive also in asymptomatic patients, in about 50% of patients 
we can have lung opacity in CT scan, and these opacities are present in 80% of patients with symptoms. And this is a report, this study was done in the people living in the uh, cruise dim uh, ship Diamond Princess. A symptomatic patient usually had ground glass opacification over consolidation, and symptomatic cases more frequently showed consolidation over ground glass opacities. And the CT scan severity score was higher in a symptomatic case compared uh, to asymptomatic patient, particularly in the lower lobes. So we can interpret the ground glass opacity as a viral cytopathic effects and a velar opacification as a result of a cytokine storm. Next slide. And uh, this is what we interpret today. Acute lung injury does a diffuse aware damage. Ground glass attenuation, crazy paving pattern is mainly observed in the early phase in which viral replication predominates. And this can lead to death mainly in fragile people when uh, innate, uh, when uh, adaptive immunity appears, we have the appearance of alveolar consolidation, archiform lines, and a pattern very similar to the organizing pneumonia and perilobular pattern. I have to confess that I have that if I saw this CT scan for Five months ago, my first hypothesis should be or could be um, anti-synthetase syndrome because the CT scan pattern are very similar in both uh, settings. Next slide. And interleukin six appear to be very important uh, to be to have a an important pathogenetic role, uh, and it may be a target for specific drugs. This, is this interleukin is produced by many cell types. It's important during the uh, ac acute or innate immunity phase, but uh, and uh, it can be produced in higher quantity when adaptive immunity appears. It, has, it is produced also by muscle cells. And in fact, one of the patients in Italy, uh, one of the first patient, patient had a very uh, bad disease, but probably, and he was a young guy, but probably, yeah, he was a runner and probably he had already a, a high level of interleukin six when he acquired the disease. And this pro-inflammatory background can be present, for example, in patients with diabetes or uh, obese patients that you know, are more prone to have a severe disease. Next slide. And also we have experimental models with other pneumoviruses documenting that interleukin-6 can be imported in order to deteriorate or to in increase the lung damage uh, 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 sustained by the subject itself. This is a, a, a paper published some years, uh, one year ago, showing that in next slide, in patient with an, in, with an increase of uh, in, that in, uh, in, in mice uh, infected with the virus, the interleukin six was higher when we had a higher lung injury, and in knockout mice uh, for interleukin six, we didn't have lung injury. So interleukin six is important for the lung damage uh, after some kind of viral infection and probably after uh, SARS-CoV-2 infection. Next slide. We have also, no, go back please. We have also some data showing that di the dimer and coagulopat is important, uh, as an important pathogenetic role. Market elevated the dimer correlate uh, uh, with a worse prognosis and may be associated with thrombophilia, disseminated intravascular coagulation. Autoptic reports point out the presence of thrombine systemic and pulmonary vessels. And there are some data showing that anticoagulant therapy mainly with low weight, molecular weight heparins seem 
seems to be associated with the increased mortality in severe COVID-19. Next slide. And now, both the above seven discussion for more than one month, the problem of lung fibrosis sequelae is appearing. We are uh, observing patients mainly discharged by ICU that develop lung fibrotic pattern. Two patterns we have observed so far, fibrosing or organizing pneumonia, CT scan pattern, or fibrosing NSIP. And pro-fibrotic mechanisms appear, probably appear during the subacute phase and probably are also incited by mechanical ventilation and hypothetical cytokines or pathways involved in this process are vascular endothelial growth factor, platelet derived growth factor, epidermal derived growth factor, uh, tissue factor, wind pathway, and so on. So the last slide, the treatment strategy should be based on in the, the above mentioned pathogenetic consideration. The best result could be to obtain vaccination, of course, but we have some data that the control of the disease can be done using immunoglobulin from recovered patients. We, we try to use inhibitors of viral replication, including chloroquine and hydroxychloroquine, protease inhibit inhibitors, retroviral um, and uh, retro anti-retrovirus drugs, some protease inhibitors such as camostat and mesylate, some anti-polymerase um, uh, or polymerase inhibitors such as remdesivir and monoclonal. There are some studies showing that probably monoclonal antibodies against spike proteins can work. The sec in the second phase, we use immunomodulators and we are using steroids. There are some reports very very weak reports showing that azithromycin could be useful, low weight, heparins, and also some inhibitors of interleukin-6, tocilizumab, and uh, sarilimumab, and inhibitors of interleukin-1, can canakinumab, also colchicine, we have in, in Italy now, uh, uh, probably we will have a trial with this drug, some JAK inhibitors such as baricitinib, topacitinib, Upa, Dacitinib, Rugzolitinib. And probably in the fibrotic phase, Nintedonib and Pirfenidone could have a role. And of course, during the severe phase of the disease, the maintenance of oxygen level uh, with also uh, CPAP, non invasive ventilation of metallic and ventilation is very important. Thank you very much. Thank you, Venerino, for this uh, very nice and comprehensive uh, presentation. I think it is very important to, to, to look at the fundamentals and the basis for it that can explain uh, the, the disease that we are uh, facing. And I think this will be now uh, complemented uh, with the more clinical approach that Claudia prepared to us uh, regarding also the presentation that uh, with clinical cases. So Venerino and Claudia, if you agree, at the end we can have a short discussion on both presentations and I thank you a lot Venerino for this very exhausted and uh, fantastic uh, uh, review that you did on the pathogenesis of the disease. Claudia, it is up to you now. Well, hello, thank you first, Carlo, for the invitation. It's very nice to share uh, experience with uh, friends. Uh, unfortunately, they are not that good experience, but we need to share to learn more because it's a very uh, long process. We started learning in the beginning of March. So thank you for the invitation. I'm going to try to expose more clinical aspects about our patients with their testicular lung disease pulmonary fibrosis and the infection by COVID. I think uh, at this moment that we have more questions than answers. There are not much evidence-based data. Uh, our questions, uh, I think it's the same question everywhere. If our ILD patients, IPF or non-IPF patients are more predisposed to have COVID-19 infection, for example, because they said uh, this infection affected people with pulmonary uh, diseases or chronic pulmonary diseases. 
if uh, they are infected, the prognosis is worse than in other chronic pulmonary diseases. We don't know uh, how uh, we manage the antifibrotic treatment in our patients or how we manage the immunosuppressant and corticosteroid treatment in our patients with all different types of ILD. And also, uh, Venerino already uh, showed us that in some cases, uh, the fibrotic uh, patterns could be a, um, a complication after a COVID infection in patients that don't have an ILD before. So um, it is possible to develop pulmonary fibrosis and how is going to be uh, the manage of that patient. I think we have a lot of questions, but to situate all the question and the first one, uh, how many patients, if the, these patients are going to be more affected than other, uh, in Spain, you know that it's like uh, 167,000 cases of uh, COVID positive patients. And uh, in Madrid, uh, if you see the data, in Madrid, there are, uh, is one of the community more affected uh, by the disease. There are 46,500 uh, persons uh, infected. So, unfortunately, we are having a lot of experience. But you can see the number is very high in the affected, but uh, we, we make a preliminary survey between um, the, the colleagues uh, from the ILD group in Madrid to just ask how many patients with ILD or IPF patients they uh, receive in their hospital and they know that uh, they are uh, infected by COVID-19. And uh, if you can see the numbers, here, when you see ILD patients, COVID positive, there are only 10 cases identified uh, until this moment. We must be very, uh, we must be very careful because we don't have, for the moment, registers or very um, uh, uh, data, solid data. Why? Because we are living a very difficult time. We are. A hospital are saturated sometimes. We don't know exactly where are our patients, but uh, the particularity of ILD patients that is in Madrid, we have uh, interstitial lung disease units, so the patients are uh, follow up uh, by phone with uh, by our nurse or by, our, by our, the doctors, and they can communicate so we can at least uh, know where they are. So. More or less, at this moment, we have only 10 patients, nine IPF patients, and one non-IPF patient, an NSIP patient. Uh, all the IPF patients we treated with antifibrotics, eight uh, IPF patients needed hospitalizations, and one, it was at home with mild symptoms. From those patients needing hospitalizations, two patients recover, and unfortunately, six patients die. Uh, why uh, there is, uh, we can say, a small number of patients affected? There are a lot of hypotheses, but not uh, really data about that. Maybe they protect themselves more than other patients because they know uh, about using masks or they were uh, advertised to using masks by the, um, the health persons. Uh, they stay more at home because they fear to, um, to get infected. They are keeping social distancing very well. Um, also the role of multidisciplinary units uh, is important because they facilitate communication and advice in this situation. For example, patients uh, don't need to go to the hospital to take the medication, the antifibrotic medication, because the pharmacies of the hospital um, send to their home or maybe also the nurse uh, of the ILD unit give to some um, familiar that come into the hospital and uh, get out the medication. Things, uh, simple things like that that could be uh, some explanation. And other more uh, physiopathological things, like there is maybe some protection with antifibrotic treatments. Uh, we don't know, but maybe some data is going to come. I'm gonna show you uh, three cases uh, about 
uh, our IND uh, a group in Madrid, and this is uh, thanks of my colleagues that uh, take the time uh, to send me uh, that cases, Dr. Alvaro Casanova from Hospital Universitario of uh, De Henares in Madrid, because I'm um, in quarantine at home, so I couldn't go to the hospital to get my own patient's um, uh, data. So this is a case of an IPF patient, male, 57 years old. Uh, he was diagnosed in February of 2017. Uh, the HRCT at the diagnosis was a possible UIP pattern, so he has a biopsy of a new IP pattern, and he started at that moment treatment with pyrfenidone. And this is a patient that it, it was uh, before uh, going to the ER department about long-term oxygen for an oxygen for the ambulation. That was the pulmonary function test that diagnosed. You can see FBC 70% of the LCO, uh, 38%. And the six mini walk test, there was a desaturation to the air force. That was the CT scan of the patient uh, at the time of diagnosis. And this patient uh, is, is in follow-up, it was in follow-up in the lung transplant unit at uh, one of the reference hospital for transplant uh, because of the age and the deterioration we follow this the, the, the last years. So he uh, went to the emergency department on 13 of March because he complained of increase of dyspnea for four days, even at rest, uh, and with his oxygen, even if he um, put four liters, then maintain only saturation of seven, uh, 77%. He also said he has cough and green yellow expectoration, this thermic sensation with 37 five, uh, centigrade. And he went to the general practitioner uh, before coming to emergency department, and they put under level fluxacin without any improvement. He has an epidemiological contact because one of his friends, he, he was with him, was COVID positive a few days ago uh, to go to, to the hospital. When he arrived to the hospital, he has 80% of saturation on four liters. Uh, he was tacky naked, not fever, and a very uh, bad general condition, pale and uh, sweaty and with respiratory work. Velcro crackers in the auscultation and in blood tests, we observe lymphopenia, fibrogen increase, and CRP increase, very increase, as you can see here. That is the chest is great. He has the last one he has in November uh, 2019, and we can see uh, the reticular pattern. you know that chest is rate is not that specific and that it was uh, the chest is rate when he uh, went to the hospital on 13 of March. And you can see we have some infiltrates, like um, maybe some kind of consolidations, bilateral uh, infiltrates, ground glass and consolidations. And here you can observe, compare with the previous one, we can see we have a, uh, a worsening chest rate. He was um, COVID positive in the pharyngeal exudate, and he was hospitalized with oxygen therapy. The protocols here we use uh, in general hydroxychloroquine plus acetromycin plus cefriaxon, and in some cases, not in all, and uh, uh, here in Madrid, less and less antiviral. Uh, like lopenavir and ritonavir. Uh, under this treatment, three days after the hospitalizations, he started with um, clinical deterioration and oxygen uh, deterioration. ICU was contacted, but uh, at that moment, the patients uh, reject the intubation. Uh, when they contacted again, there was a a problem because uh, there are there is no bed in ICUs here in Madrid, so they contact the center, uh, the reference center for the transplantation, and they accept uh, that the patient uh, could be transferred, but they ask the patient uh, need to be intubated before the transfer. 
So it was very complicated situation for a young uh, patient. And uh, even if he received uh, steroids, bolus of steroids of 500 milligrams uh, intravenous, uh, only received one bolus because uh, unfortunately he died uh, the 17th of March. So it's not a very um, uh, successful case for all the therapies that we are using. Uh, I have another case um, better than this one. It's a, an, another case of an IPF patient, 72 years old, and he went to an emergency department of 27 of March. Uh, if you can see uh, here, the pulmonary function tests are not that good. Uh, the last he has has an FBC of 48% and a VLC of 30%. He was uh, under oxygen, long-term oxygen therapy, and the antifibrotic treatment was of 150 milligrams twice a day. So when he uh, arrived to the air department, the arterial blood gas uh, with his oxygen, it was not uh, that bad, and 91% of um, oxygen. And uh, he has lymphopenia, fibrogen increase, and very high the de dimmer level, and also very high PCR level. So as, as you can see, um, that is the characteristic of the patients that need to be hospitalized. Because of the high uh, de dimmer uh, level, uh, an angio tag was performed and pulmonary embolism was ruled out. But uh, what the radiologist uh, says in the, in the report is there is some ground glass areas um, superimposed in the UIP pattern that the patient presented before. So you can see the images here with some um, patches, uh, ground glass areas. And here you have um, in more detail in the basis. So the patient also was hospitalized and treated with uh, more or less uh, the protocol, hydroxychloroquine, acitromycin, but also he, that patient, uh, this patient received methylprednisolone uh, 40 milligrams twice a day for five days. An antifibrotic treatment with OFEB was maintained during the hospitalization. But uh, uh, on April uh, 3, uh, they present in the blood test some elevation of transaminase, so OFEB was stopped. It was like uh, eight days after the, um, the, the beginning of the hospitalizations, and we need to remember that he uh, uh, received hydroxychloroquine and acitromycin, and... Uh, in that kind, we don't know exactly if the combination or only one of the drugs or, or, or FEP uh, could cause this elevation of transaminase. We can discuss later. So the uh, OFEP was stopped and the clinical and the analytical evolution was good. The blood test three days after at six on, on 6 April, uh, the transaminase, uh, they were normal. So he was discharged on, on April 7, and at, at that moment was still positive um, in the test. And so we have a special protocols to discharge people in uh, quarantine at home. So this case is uh, much better. He's still in good, in good shape at home. Uh, we are controlling uh, what my colleague said by phone, and he's okay. So what about uh, that you see, we uh, already seen do, two cases of IPF patients, but what about other ILDs? What information we can have? There is not that much. Here is a series uh, of uh, Pavia Lombardi that you know is one of the zone more touched by the um, pandemic. And uh, it's a survey for patients with chronic arthritis uh, treated by biological uh, drugs, uh, anti-rheumatic drugs. Uh, but uh, they are not patients 
with known ILD by chronic arthritis. There were more female and 57% with rheumatoid arthritis and 43% with spondyloarthritis. And it was a survey to the, the patients to know uh, exactly um, uh, this, if they pass uh, COVID-19, if they have confirmed or highly suggestive of con uh, clinical, highly suggestive of COVID-19. As you can see of three, 120 patients, only um, five, uh, nine uh, patients, uh, eight patients have COVID conf confirmed and highly suggested, and other patients have only an epidemiological contact uh, with uh, COVID positive patients. As you can see, more frequently they have rheumatoid arthritis, and the important thing is that. Uh, these patients have treatment, basal treatment with different biological treatment, adalimumab, etanercept, abatacep, tocilizumab, baricitinib. Some of these tre treatment are all also in investigation in treating patients with COVID. Uh, also, some uh, of them have low dose corticosteroids. When say low dose, there were uh, five milligrams or less than five milligrams. Um, five patients has concomitant hydroxychloroquine uh, treatment already. So uh, it is important because uh, we can see that all patients with symptoms or infection, uh, at that moment they withdraw, what they say the investigator withdraw, the biological drugs at the time of the symptoms, and uh, the data say that they don't have significant relapse of rheumatoid diseases, and no of the patients, no one of the patients develops severe respiratory complications or die in this service. Only one uh, patient was hospitalized with low flow oxygen supplementation. Uh, what we can conclude is a survey is very difficult to conclude something, but we can say that these patients with um, immunosuppressant uh, drugs need to be um, uh, follow up very close and very strictly. And uh, patients with chronic arthritis with this kind of drug, they not seem to be an increased risk of respiratory or life threatening complication from COVID 19. And this finding, could be explained uh, because of severe respiratory complications are more caused by the aberrant inflammatory and cytokine response, as we already uh, saw in the last presentation of Professor Poletti. Other um, rare disease that we see in our clinics in, um, in ILD is uh, LAM, lymphangioleomyomatosis. Uh, here the, we have some recommendations, expert recommendations that make the LAM foundation. And you can see there is non-specific recommendation, it's mere general for elderly people and those with underlying conditions, the general recommendations for everyone, social distancing, avoid travel, try to get the medication properly and uh, to continue the treatment, but a special recommendation for patients with LAM, um, the, the foundation said that they don't have higher risk to catch COVID just for being LAM patients, but of course, an underlying disease uh, is uh, also risky when we have an underlying disease, and maybe we can take in, uh, we need to take into account the immunosuppressant medication, especially serolimus. Regarding serolimus, um, they um, consider the continuation of the basal treatment, not to stop the treatment preventively, but if we start with active infection, uh, they maybe the patients will need a, a reduction or maybe an interruption, but that depends on the uh, doctors uh, at the, the moment uh, they have the infection. So as you see, there are some general recommendations as already um, uh, Carlo uh, shows in the presentation, uh, the British um, recommendations. 
The, uh, this cartoon you already seen, and uh, Professor Poletti explained very well uh, what happened with the uh, two phases, viral response phase and host inflammatory response phase. So uh, this uh, data in our patients maybe can um, um, guide us to know when is the proper moment to use uh, maybe some immunosuppressant therapy, or if our patients under immunosuppressant are some kind or not protected from being in very uh, severe um, uh, forms of COVID-19. This is another case of a different um, pathology, it's an NSIP, uh, female, uh, female diagnosed of NSIP of 81 years old, and you can see he has uh, like a risk factor diabetes, dyslipemia, and uh, the primary function test in January 2020, it was 68 SBC and DLCO of 38%. She was treated by low-dose corticosteroids and a satioprine and she has also long oxygen therapy, long-term oxygen therapy. He went to the emergency department um, by uh, saying that he has more dyspnea until minimal effort, and he required four liters of oxygen and no other symptoms, as you can see here, not fever, nor myalgia, nor arthralgia, nor change in expectoration or increased cough. And uh, he has an epidemiological contact uh, positive because uh, she was living in a religious congregation and relatives living there has symptoms and they were COVID positive. In the emergency department, she was um, hemodynamically stable, taking with saturation of 90% with 31% of oxygen. He has vercoclacles. Uh, as you can see here, he performed an ACG. The QT was 433. With all this drug that we are using, we are very careful with the ACG. And he has um, a uh, uh, gasometry that it was uh, with oxygen, with the uh, oxygen 66. And uh, lymphocytosis, uh, lymphopenia, small lymphopenia, and PCR elevated, more or less like other patients, less severe maybe. And that was the chest X-ray. This chest X-ray, it was uh, before uh, the infection. And the radiology says that uh, comparing with this chest X-ray, there is uh, consolidations, peripheral consolidations in both lungs and uh, in the epidemiological context was compatible with COVID-19 infection. But um, in this case, this patient has two uh, PCR that were negative. I think we have that problem also with the false negative. Um, and uh, it was diagnosed of bilateral pneumonia due to possible COVID-19 versus ILD acute exacerbation. Uh, an angiotag was request to rule out uh, pulmonary embolism, but it has not been done because unfortunately the patient uh, died uh, last Friday. So that's one of the problems and Professor uh, Carlo Robalo says in the introduction that uh, we have problems when interstitial lung disease encounter uh, COVID-19 because it's challenges to know if it's, if it's uh, acute pneumonia, if it's an acute exacerbation, if we have already a known ILD, or if, or if we are uh, in front of COVID-19 infection. I think we have to be, um, there are not much literature, we have to be very, um, uh, reasonable at this moment with the pandemic, I think we can see the more the more frequent. Uh, that are some uh, studies uh, that uh, said what is the pattern which can found in patients with COVID-19. You can see the difference because the cases I show you, there are 
uh, more of the cases have chest its rate. We are not doing more uh, CT scan or HRCT in these patients. Only if we had suspicion of pulmonary embolism, uh, we make an angiocity. So there is not the same situation that maybe in China that uh, we can see that, that more frequent patterns are grand glass opacity here on the left and in the right consolidations. So that is another report that say that the frequency of grand glass opacity is uh, the more frequent uh, pattern that we can found that it's 87, uh, 86 and consolidations 29% after the crazy pattern. And uh, what, so you, uh, that's why we see in our patients. That is another uh, radiology perspective comparing uh, SARS of 2003, MERX and COVID-19. Uh, in the symptoms, more or less, they are very um, similar. Uh, but we already uh, hear Professor Poletti that depend of the receptors, there are much more variation in the symptoms of COVID-19, um, not only pulmonary involvement, but also digestive involvement and upper um, uh, airways involvement. And here you have the anormalities, uh, also again, Consolidation versus grand glass are the more frequent, and in some cases, especially in MERS, pneumothorax on pleural effusion. Uh, what's the problem with the patients with COVID-19 that we need to face from now? That patients at the moment we start in Madrid in March, they start in Madrid to be hospitalized at the beginning of March. And as you know, most of the patients spend a lot of time in ICU or hospitalized. Uh, that patients are going uh, to be discharged, those with a good evolution, will be discharged in the next weeks. So what we need to know uh, uh, to implement in the follow-up of these patients. Um, remember, we have here a paper of 2004 after the epidemic of SARS in 2002 in China that shows that uh, 29 patients with SARS, they have um, HRCT during the hospitalization and consider HRCT at presentation and HRCT at the follow-up but they consider follow-up during the hospital stay. So we don't have much data to a more long follow-up of that patient. As you see, grand glass opacity, opacities and consolidation, there was uh, the more um, uh, patterns uh, that we can found in the, in the CT scan, but also a mixed bilateral pattern with ground glass attenuation and some kind of reticulation, but in the minor of patients. Uh, eight patients of that 90, uh, 29 patients present reticulation with associated architectural distortion and mild transcription bronchiectomy. I mean, in this study, uh, the follow-up scan obtained uh, in hospitalized patients show that uh, findings consisting with fibrosis in the small in a small percentage of patients. So we don't know exactly uh, which percentage of patients they are going to evolve to that problem that could be lung fibrotic sequela or fibrotic pattern after the infection of COVID-19. So one of the, the we have a lot of questions, but the important question are who are going to present this fibrotic pattern. Maybe patients with severe pulmonary involvement, especially patients discharged from ICU, or patients that we can call moder uh, with moderate pulmonary involvement. Maybe that patients are uh, uh, the ones that have bilateral pneumonia, they were hospitalized, they require oxygen, but not uh, get into an ICU. And the follow-up, when we have to start in the follow-up, at what time? Which test we need to perform in these patients? Pulmonary function test, only chest is right, HRCT? We don't know. So it's a very um, 
a, a preliminary proposal of follow up, but uh, we uh, it's open for discussion. Maybe there is uh, some patients that only have a chest is rate or pneumonia and it was discharged like, the, uh, like this. And you know that uh, here in Spain, most of the patients only have chest is rate. So maybe we can uh, control them one or two months after discharge. And if the chest is raised, it's normal. Uh, but everything is okay, but if it's abnormal, we can do HRCT or pulmonary function tests, especially spirometry and DLCO, because I think DLCO is more sensitive to um, found any uh, pulmonary alteration. And uh, that patient that had previous uh, CTs or HRCTs or angio CTs or abnormal chest is raised, we have um, to do perform at the same time pulmonary function test our HRCT at six months. We don't found a place here for the blood test after the discharge of the hospital. As you can see, uh, because of the pressure here, most of the patients were discharged with abnormal chest is rate and abnormal blood test, of course, better than they were uh, when they were hospitalized. But that is a problem we are not, um, we are starting to face this in the next week. So, uh, that's all that I wanted to tell you to start the discussion, and thank you very much. So I think you raised uh, many important points, you both, uh, uh, regarding with the particular uh, severity in, in some populations, in some patients, also I could say in some locations, because we are seeing a particular uh, severity of this disease in some uh, geographic locations and not in others. Maybe there are some uh, some factors, some genetics, some uh, uh, geographic, some uh, uh, environmental and the other factors that might be related with that. I think we are far from uh, having answers uh, with this as with many other things in COVID. But I think this is um, maybe an interesting point because also in the population of uh, 10, 9 IPF patients you showed, Claudia, in, in Madrid, you had six patients that died, so it's more than 60% uh, let, uh, lethality in this uh, population, but you have one patient at home, for instance, and you have a young patient, 50-something years old, that died uh, and was waiting for transplant. So I think there is a huge heterogeneity also in uh, IPF and ILD population, maybe this is something not only related with ILD patients, but related with, with our, all our, our population in the different geographic uh, uh, localizations. This is one point that we, we can discuss, maybe. I think... Not, uh, yes, yes, about it, please. About this question, uh, preparing this uh, talk, uh, it's true that we talk with, with the other colleagues, and the situation we are facing in Madrid, in Madrid, it's very serious. Uh, in the past, uh, last week, when it was at the time that patients were hospitalized, uh, you can see that we faced a very uh, bad situation. It's like a war situation. I mean, ICU were uh, were full, and um, the hospital were fully dedicated of COVID-19. So I think uh, the problem to don't have bed in ICU, it was very important. So that's uh, why uh, for the general population and for the person we have uh, uh, chronic uh, diseases, pulmonary or not pulmonary, it's very important. Uh, the message that we are transmitting to stay at home and to maintain social distances because uh, the difference maybe is when you arrive in a hospital that are completely collapsed and we arrive in a hospital that they still have possibilities to do something. We don't know if that changed, uh, unfortunately, the, the, um, the outcome of uh, the patients, I said, but at, at least uh, we try to have all the resources to the more severe patients. So I, I we, we are not sure it's uh, uh, because of the IPF condition or it's because yeah. of the, uh, the condition in the hospital. It's difficult to know, but I think with better we have the hospital discharge 
from uh, severe um, patients we have place for other ones is, is better. Yes, yes. I, I also I like also to raise two points. One related with CT, the other related with the evolution to the to fibromyalgia fibrosis. I, I understood from your presentation, Venerina, that a lot more than half of the patients, symptomatic patients, have uh, already changes in uh, that we can uh, see in in CT in high resolution CT. So. Uh, uh, on the other hand, the Flashner Society released last uh, week uh, recommendations to not use CT as a screening in these patients because it was what was happening in China at the beginning, at least. I, I think it was what was uh, uh, what was happening in China and in some in some places. Also, we are in Portugal. In some hospitals, they, it was. Uh, routine that uh, CT was done and to understand exactly the, the the situation of the patient and eventually to detect the more severe disease. So, uh, where uh, do we stay? I, I understood also that Claudia, you prefer uh, X-ray and you use much more X-ray than CT. What is your opinion, uh, Venerino? We, we had less pressure compared to Madrid or to Lombardy, so we perform in every patient CT scan. And uh, it, it, it's for us, because we had the opportunity or the possibility to do this, you can have patient with normal chest X-ray, and not, not negligible number of patients with normal chest X-ray that have clear cut ground glass opacity. So, uh, and the CT scan is more sensitive compared to the nasal swap, nasal swap sensitivity diagnostic yield is around 60%. And we have even three patients with three negative nasal swap, typical CT scan and DL was eventually diagnostic. So if you have the possibility, I think that the Society recommendation is related to the fact that uh, as already Claudia mentioned that if you have a big pressure, you don't have the possibility to have CT scan in all patients. But if you don't have this kind of pressure, CT scan can be very useful in order to separate typical cases for not improbable or almost impossible CT scan pattern related to COVID. And this is much more easier and faster compared to the nasal swab. Yes, yes. I uh, just one comment. I think it's, uh, I agree with Benarino, it's more sensitive and everything, but the problem in hospital uh, is that uh, to move the patients infected by COVID-19, we have to have um, a CT scan, especially for them, uh, a, a CT machine, especially for them. And also you need uh, to clarify the protocols because we need also the CT for other patients. In the hospital, there are more than one uh, CT, uh, so it's, uh, it's not that complicated. But the problem was the patients that arrived to the hospital, uh, most of them has already chest is rate alterated and very compatible with COVID-19. So at that moment, the only um, reasons to perform CT scan, and most of them are angio CT scan, is to rule out pulmonary embolism and to see if the patient deteriorate or go to ICU, they perform a, a, a CT scan. So uh, it's complicated to know. It's true that the Fleischner Society um, make some recommendations regarding of the severity or symptoms of not for the patients. But uh, at the end, we are learning. And uh, of course, have more information is very important, but it's not possible. That's why in some places, that's why uh, the follow-up of that patient is going to be very uh, specific. Yeah. Must be specific. Yes, I think this is perfectly understandable. And we understood completely your both message. I think it's very clear, of course. Uh, another point maybe to, to finalize because it's a very long webinar. I could stay all the day with you, I can tell you, because it's very agreeable. First of all, we didn't see each other for, for many long time. So I think it's a good, a nice opportunity to, to see your faces and uh, talk directly with you. But uh, of course, we have to, to finish this. But my last question could be related with the antifibrotic uh, role and the, the, the evolution to fibrosis. First, because uh, first to, to Venerino, uh, the, the, the majority of patients that are 
the Tevin evolution to fibrosis are the one who have, for instance, the fibroblast foci you showed uh, already in the pathology, or the cytokine storm can also uh, lead to, uh, to a situation where the pulmonary fibrosis can, uh, at the end, superimpose. Uh, this is one, one question. And the other is that, of course, we should not uh, rule, uh, should not, uh, we should maintain the antifibrotic uh, treatment for the patients that have uh, the, those treatments, namely our patients with IPF. But the question, the, the other way around is, is there a protective role uh, for nintedanib and prifenidone for this patient and also in order to uh, prevent the evolution in the near future? with this uh, flow chart that you show uh, very nice, Claudia, is there the possibility that the, with the antifibrotic in patients that have no pulmonary fibrosis uh, at the beginning can prevent the evolution? It's for both. If you want to start Venerino now, and then Claudia will finish. Yes, and they have two very interesting questions. The first is we are observing some patients that develop a fibrosing pattern in CT scan uh, uh, after one month, one month in the half uh, 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 after the admission to the hospital. So, and the CT scan pattern is usually fibrosing organizing pneumonia with still uh, uh, viral opacification and some uh, traction bronchiectasis or even fibrotic and SIP. This patient, in the majority or the large majority of the cases, were already in ICU, so probably mechanical ventilation can have a role. Uh, I am not sure of that. And uh, but if we consider, we have some data on biopsy, and all the patient has diffusal alveolar damage, and we know that diffusal alveolar damage as histological pattern can progress to fibrosis. It's a little bit different compared to UIP, but with a huge fibrosis, so it can be expected as, as a result of an acute lung injury. This is the first question. The second is that we can have some, this antifibrotic drug can protect. It's very interesting because we know that pilfenidone has a pleomorphic uh, activity that can interfere with tumor necrosis, um, TGF beta, and uh, also nintedanib as an anti-angiogenic effect. So both drugs uh, theoretically would have a role in order to prevent lung injury or to prevent lung fibrosis in this subject. But of course, we need uh, more, more uh, precise studies on the subject. Yeah. So... Uh, I agree with Benarino. It's very. Um, it would be very exciting to know. We need more data about uh, patients with IPF that uh, are infected. That depends of the um, the status they are. If they are in ICU, of course, uh, antifibrotic treatment can be uh, stopped uh, for for the moment they are in ICU because uh, it's a special moment, but not because of the antifibrotic treatment uh, is gonna be deleterious or something, but just because of the situation of the patients. When patients are hospitalized, but uh, are eating and uh, um, taking other drugs, as you see in one of my case, uh, most of the patients stayed under the basal treatment and basal antifibrotic treatment, and we have to take care of um, interactions between medications because other drugs can uh, um, elevate, transaminate, and things like that, but they can uh, stay or remain on treatment. And about the, the role of antifibrotic uh, for prevent fibrosis, or maybe for that patients uh, that are going to develop fibrosis and maybe a progressing fibrosis phenotype, We'll see in the future, but the future is still um, is starting because we have two clinical trials uh, already ongoing in China. One uh, clinical trial with pirfenidone, um, and these patients uh, need to be uh, um, assignated to pirfenidone or placebo if they have more than seven days 
of infection. Um, so this is a very acute phase. So to to prove or to try to know what happened, what Benarino says. And the other just started uh, two days ago. Where, when you see in clinical trials, there are a lot of trials coming. And uh, it's with nintedanib uh, for um, more uh, not uh, um, acute uh, phase, but more subacute phase to see what happened with that patient. And also there are a lot of clinical trials with uh, immunosuppressant like corticosteroids, or cyclosporin or tocilizumab. So we'll see in the near future. So thank you both for your excellent presentations and for this nice, very nice discussion. I think, uh, I'm sure that in the near future, we will have more patients, unfortunately, with the pulmonary fibrosis coming from this uh, tragedy. Uh, I hope you can keep safe at home and in your hospitals. Please uh, keep safe and uh, Say hello also to our common friends in Madrid and in Forli. And it was really a pleasure in the splendid moments that we were, uh, we, we passed together now in, the, in this uh, webinar. Thank you, Claudia. Thank you, Venerino. And thank you uh, for your fantastic participation. Uh, muito obrigado. Vamos então encerrar agora. E, e agradeço a todos. Agradeço mais uma vez à SPP e a todos esta possibilidade. Muito boa noite.